Hello again, friends. The great Brian Last here, you there, and we are back with a bonus drive through some questions before the next Jim Cornette experience comes out. I said who I am. Here he is, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. Oh, just hop right into it. You couldn't do much damage in that short amount of time, Brian. That's that's the thing. Here, what? Go ahead and tell the people what we're doing here. It's a bonus program because you said you've actually called me to crawl out of my attic space where I'm, my people are preparing for insulation. Uh, we're re-insulating everything. We're changing a bunch of stuff up. More on that on the experience. And you said we haven't done enough questions from the from the people, the cult of Cornette. We have not answered enough of their questions lately because we've been concentrating on all the big news from WrestleMania Night 1 and WrestleMania Night 2 and the Rotten Raw after WrestleMania and so on, so on. And... Vince becoming Dick Dastardly. And does that make Cousin Bruce muttly? Um, we've been talking about all that stuff, and we haven't answered the piss. So now you have some questions from the people. We're giving them a bonus program here. That's exactly what we're doing, and I guess that does make him muttly, which is a pretty funny visual right there. But we have several topics that have been coming in. So let's get to them, because we didn't get them on the sh past week's show because we were so packed with WrestleMania news. That's and what I just said! That's what you just said. Well, yeah. let's find out what the cult of Cornette has just Maybe said. Maybe where I heard it. Well, Jim, several listeners have sent in questions about a recent Bret Hart quote. I'm trying to see where this is from. He was on HN Live. And I can tell you, we have heard from people that Bret Hart, I guess, and his children have restarted Stampede Wrestling in Calgary. So let's stay tuned to see yeah, what and, that is. And under another name, though, it, it, have I, am I, do I have a brain tumor? It was... Possibly something to do with the dungeon. It was, it's not Stampede Wrestling, uh, uh, that brand, is it? But they are starting a wrestling promotion. I think it's called Not Bruce. <laughs> He's not even there. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> yes, I understand they did quite successfully here recently. Well, here's a quote from Bret Hart a lot of people wanted to get your take on. When I think of WWE and I see 20 wrestlers crowded together outside on the floor, and someone dives over the top rope and knocks them all down like bowling pins. I roll my eyes at how pathetic wrestling is today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hold on, that's not the end of it. That's not the end. Okay, I'm with him. He's got me hooked. Top to bottom, all the top wrestlers and all the middle bottom wrestlers in WWE and AEW, all slapping their leg on every punch and slap. It's to the point where I can't watch wrestling today. Sadly. It's getting too phony. The best professional wrestling needs to pretend to be real. When it stops pretending to be real, which is all of what they're doing today, it's ridiculous. And that's Bret Hart's quote. Now, wait a minute. You said that's Bret. I thought that was me. Um, no. <laughs> it sounds like it. But, I mean, how many times do, more do people have to hear something? And and there's Brett, who is another individual who's not particularly concerned about having another job on television or with a wrestling promotion that not of his own or his children's making. Uh, so therefore, he can actually come out and tell the blatant fucking truth. And the only thing I disagree with, he said, I don't know top to bottom. I wouldn't include everyone in the sloppiness category. You know, we do have. There's some people that we praise highly. And I think, for example, if if Stu Hart had Gunther in Stampede Wrestling, he would have been, uh, you know, potentially as as over as any heel he could have ever had, you know, Mongolian stomper level. He might need to work on the mean faces. Um, but for the most part, yes, the the art, if you will, of wrestling or wh what Brett talks about as pro wrestling is mostly lost in this, you know, stew of malaise these days in what everybody's doing and rushing through and diving and fucking about. <laughs> I sound, I'm starting to sound like Adrian Street now. And there is skipping and fucking about. But I can see his disappointment because he did something at a high level 
and contributed to the art form and respected the art form, and that art form is lost. And, you know, it's the same... I, I know it's hard for some fans to understand, especially if they're of a certain age and came to view wrestling as a certain thing over the last 20 years or whatever. But it, it's not necessarily a, a, a bitterness or a, a phobia of foreigners. I don't like Japanese people or whatever, this and that and the other thing. It's... Wouldn't you say, Brian, you used to work in the music industry, that if they were telling the truth, not in a public interview where there's record companies that are going to get involved or management agents or whatever, but if any recording artist, a, a talented singer or band, if they were just telling the truth to somebody on the street or at a party somewhere, were they not offended? by Millie Vanilli, right? Anybody who does something at a high level and sees someone else not only pissing all over it, but potentially being celebrated for that, there is an element of what the fuck are you people looking at? And uh, I'm sorry, but I have to be honest about what we're seeing here. Do you think? No, I think it's different with wrestling because I don't think anyone got as offended by Millie Vanilli. People were bothered by it. Now, well, wait a minute. I'm not talking about the fans. I'm talking about the actual musicians. Yeah. First of all, you're talking, about, you're talking about the musicians who give a shit about the Grammys, first of all. So that limits the pool of musicians you're talking about to, what, 100 musicians? In terms of the categories Millie Vanilli would be in? I'm, th no, I'm so, thinking what, what, Whitney talented... Houston is mad at Millie Vanilli. I don't know. No, no, no. no. Wait, a wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Any talented singer, especially ones that have never won Grammys, but some that have because it devalues the award. What about some fucking more oddly? Do you think that the goddamn when Mr. T uh, not only came into the fucking wrestling business and was not looked upon kindly but do you think that any accomplished actor when mr t walked in said oh fuck this fucking guy is a star and i'm a bit player i would think there's a natural element i certainly have it of resentment of people who are pissing on something that you do at a at a high level i think more offensive from the grammys those years is when jethro tull got what was it best Hard rock <laughs> album instead of Metallica. No, it no, it was it was it was best metal album. Best heavy metal, yeah, best yes. heavy metal album instead of Metallica. <laughs> Jethro Tull at like eighty nine. I would have given it to him for Aqualung, but I, you know, in eighty nine, I'm not sure. But anyway, I I agree with with Brett because of everything Brett said, and it's it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way, but it is. You know what Oscar Gamble says. A lot of people don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. The fact that someone like Brett will come out and say this, and you come out and say this, and you both have something in common, you're not looking for work, and there's a lot of other people who know better, but who need work, and they may go to a place like an AEW, and it's really more there than WWE just because of the structure backstage. You know, the agents of WWE yeah. can only do so much, and in AEW, they have no idea what the fuck they could do. In AEW, we've heard one guy after another, whether they are someone who has sound strategy or not, but veterans like Tully Blanchard, Jake Roberts, different people say, none of these guys want to listen to me. None of them were Bret Hart in a ring. They were very different, but you and Bret Hart came from different backgrounds too, and you ended up with the same philosophy. It seems that anyone who has this, hey, wrestling is supposed to be presented this way, and you could have characters in it, but it's supposed to be presented this way, they're pushed aside. Maybe you have a CM Punk or a FTR who embrace it or an MJF, it seems like. But there are too many people who don't want to hear what like a Bret Hart would say about something like this. About how a Jim Ross, who for good or for bad, who was oh, right. Oh, yeah, he, he got right hounded he puts, into silence. He, he's like, I'm sure he's now just like, fuck, y'all do whatever's right. Here, here's a sledgehammer. Have at it. You know, because he tried. And it was Brandon Cutler who came after him on Twitter for it, remember? <laughs> and say what you want to about anybody in any profession anywhere in the world, but does anybody believe 
that when the subject is professional wrestling, that Brandon Cutlet has some advice or fucking opinion that would matter to give to Jim Ross to change his opinion of things. I think not. Jim Ross would piss all over you, man. Cutler. For heaven's sake, Cutlet. But that's the issue. Like a Bret Hart who's saying this, there are guys who will embrace it, but there's a lot of guys who... It just seems like the attitude is, I got into wrestling just to do my own thing. I really don't give a shit about you or what anyone else thinks yeah, about Yeah, well, and, and, and once again, you know, they are... They are, this opinion and that mindset is fostered and they're on guaranteed contracts. And in most cases, they, they, they don't need to particularly draw money on a regular basis, nor can they potentially get fired at the fucking whim of a fucking eraser. So they're more into what they like to do than what either they're being asked to do or what they need to do to fucking get over and stay employed and draw money. And that was, I think the difference between the current crop and the veterans is that for most of everybody from the territory days or from that period of time, even if you had multiple options of places to go, you still didn't want to flop, nor did you want to fucking be erased and have to pack up and move before you were ready. So you not only figured out how to get over and get your shit over, but do it within the framework of what you were being asked to do and what people working with you would allow you to do. And I've talked about this, that there's so many stunts that I see in these matches that if anybody had wanted to do something like that, if they'd have suggested somebody to do it with them and cooperate with that, they'd have been laughed out of the fucking locker room. So... But, you know, but that was when you actually, oh, geez, I better not break my fucking leg because I got to work next week to make a check. So I I think these fucking knuckleheads like Darby Allen jumping over his fucking house for free. I think they would sometimes rather go out in a blaze of glory. Hey, I broke my leg and I'm fucked up for six months, but I'm getting a check every week to lay in bed and look at that fucking cool bump I took off that ladder. He's one of the ones, he's one of the ones who listens to the veterans. But I'm just saying the younger folks do not have anywhere near the self-preservation instincts that previous generations did, nor do they have the compulsion if they work for the big companies and are under contract of having to stay healthy because they can fucking still get a check and, you know, and, and be heroes on Twitter. Here, here's pictures of my fucking surgery where my taint was removed but when it's on national tv is it the wrestler's fault or the promoter's fault you said the word framework before should each promotion have a framework i don't care what you used to do it has to fit into the framework of the promotion which a good wrestling promotion like you and bret hart would talk about presented as being real this is all well, really yeah, happening with real people. yes you're you're i've always thought that there's no reason to do this anymore if you're not trying to make people believe something about your performance is legitimate and you're just then you're just as you said aggressive tumbling but at the same time yes there needs to be a framework and there needs to the promoter and or booker and or the agents should not have suggestion power but veto power over people doing things that they may want to do but it's not an acceptable risk reward ratio. Even a lot of times I would just in ring of honors. First time I had to do this. Cause even at OVW, all the young guys, they're in their twenties. They're coming from everywhere. They weren't fucking even pitching the idea of multiple stacked pieces of furniture, uh, you know, uh, in the ring and bumps over the top through flaming, whatever the fuck. Right. But in Ring of Honor, sometimes we would veto something based on, as I mentioned to you, we talked about it on one of the programs recently, Steen and Mark Briscoe want to do a splash out of the fucking balcony. And with Tony Khan, he has to understand that even in the people who aren't worth it, much less the few he has who are, he's got hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of dollars tied up in each guy. And even the, the young guys that are trying to get over hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so to get a return on his investment, they have to be ambulatory 
cognizant and able to fucking perform in some way on television. And so just because they have the idea that, oh, I, it'll be such a cool pop if I take a Canadian destroyer off of a ladder bridged between another ladder and the top rope over the top rope and through two tables to the concrete floor. What a fucking pop. Yeah, the pop you heard was the bone breaking. Yeah. You know what the ironic thing is? It's an amazing move to do if you were doing an angle for a guy to be out for six months to a year. Because that's be exactly how long what happened. To come back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I've said, did, did, again, did he plan to come to work next week? And why would you be able to? Remember I've told a story about me and Bubba Ray. Got fucking hot and yelled at each other because without my knowledge, he had come from the main roster and they came to OVW. And I guess they were doing things a little dr more drastic than we were down here at the time. But to send the people home happy, which is what my words were, he powerbombed one of Jillian Hall, who was at the time one of my female valets as well as a wrestler, off the top rope through a fucking table. So I had to fucking take her out of goddamn everything and leave her off TV for two weeks because how the fuck do I explain? The Bubba Ray Dudley powerbombed this 130-pound woman off the top rope through a fucking table, and she's back the next week, even if we had her on crutches and in a neck brace. So, it, it, again, at some point, the, the agent, if Tony's the booker and also the promoter and also the bottle washer and the fucking ball washer and whatever else he's fucking doing. Music. He's got to be the one to say No. I don't care if people will pop. It's That's ridiculous. You're going too far. Neither one of you are neither in a position of so important I can't replace you or just meaningless that I want to replace you. So let's keep it right in the middle and do have a nice match and don't kill yourself. That's too much. You know, that I don't have to be sold. that This is not the main event of a pay-per-view that's going to gross $50 million and the finish of the match depends on that fucking spot, so who gives a shit? Do not do that. Nobody will remember it in a couple weeks, except you, because you're going to break your fucking neck. And then move on to something else. And so if they did it without, I'll say this and we'll, we're done, if they did it without telling somebody that we're going to do it and without asking permission to do it, I would fire both of them. I would fire Dante uh, with his broken leg because that's almost like a fucking suicide attempt on the air. And if my agent cleared it or my producer or whatever they call those people, uh, then I would fire that particular fucking agent or producer, whoever it may be. Because I can't imagine anybody saying that heard that would be allow them if they had veto power if they just said i wish you guys wouldn't do that and they did it anyway then i'd go back to firing the talent well the sad part is you can't fire the real person they're trying to pop with it and that's the guy in the back but jim let's get another... oh, I, th I thought you meant uncle dave well we'll get to uncle dave in a little bit here but i want to play you this uh, audio because several people have sent it in it's a clip that apparently has been going around on tiktok so that is uh, certainly a clip form, probably out of context in is one fashion or another. Some type of propaganda benefiting the Chinese? Well, we will find out about that momentarily. I'm going to play you some audio. It's around a minute or so. Sami Zayn talking about WWE creative, I presume, based on what I'm reading here. Triple H was on creative. I never got on screen with Roman. Hmm. And then when Triple H did get, I finally did get on screen with Roman. Whether that's a coincidence, because like I said, the first time I finally did get on screen with Roman that took the story to the next level, happened to be a lot of stars lining up, you know, the Usos weren't there, Heyman wasn't there, it was in Montreal, all these things. Would that have happened if Hunter wasn't in charge? I, I don't know. All I know is I can definitely point to the time he wasn't in charge and say I was kept away from being on screen with Roman. And then once he was in charge, all of a sudden I am on screen and it's allowed to breathe and see where it goes. Because if I do get on screen with Roman and we start doing stuff with the Usos and all that and it's not really working, then, then okay, then you go somewhere else. But because it got, it started to work, it got room to breathe. And as it breathed, it, it grew, mm. you know? So whether that uh, would have happened without him, I don't know. But probably not. And there's the clip, and I believe that's Ariel Hawani based on the uh, 
the little grunting hmm or whatever that was. <laughs> I'm not sure. It doesn't identify the source here. Based on the grunting, it appears to be our friend Ariel. Um, again, there, poor Sammy. When was this? If this was recent, he may be being a little too honest for his own good. Um, I think, you know, remember last year at WrestleMania, he was in a fucking mousetrap. And this year, he's goddamn winning the tag team title, and he's had the best run of his career. So, yeah, if I was him, I would like... It was like when we went from Ken Mantell's booking in World Class to Dusty's booking in Crockett. Much, much better fucking upside. What do you think you would be feeling right now if you were one of these guys that were either there and believed in Triple H and saw results... I mean, morale's been up and everything else over the last several months. Or if you were someone who came back to the company, how how soon after Vince came back did Tony Khan's <laughs> phone go off and it was like, hello, it's William Regal. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> do you have a place for my son? <laughs> yeah. I'm, or you better, you know, my son's not really working out. I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what do you think you would feel if you were one of these guys that or in that company and feeling good about Triple H and all of a sudden the panic or the changes are setting in. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> you know, but here's the thing. <laughs> Look at this now. Let's say you're a young wrestler. You have some confidence in your ability and, you know, your, uh, your talent and upward momentum if you get an opportunity. Now, do you want to remember we were talking about, well, do you want to place your career in at one point in the hands of a, 80 year old billionaire maniac, or you want to go over and work with all your friends and all friends wrestling. Well, now the thing is, I think they got most of their friends jobs by now. So now do you want to go work for Tony Khan, who appears to be, he definitely has too much adrenaline or too much something or other going on. And is all over the place and has dropped the ball time after time on creating new stars and the EVPs have their circle of friends that have pretty much all been employed since then. They just brought another one back. One of the smash brothers. Uh, so do you know, do you go in and try to infiltrate their circle of friends? So you'll get used whether you're worth a shit or not, or if you're good, do you trust your career with Tony Khan? Who's, who can't even fucking get Hobbs over in three years. He's in witness protection. Or do you go now to what, if you have any chance to work for the WWE at this point, which is now literally part of a 20 something billion dollar, billion dollar conglomerate with every goddamn Hollywood agent and movie studio at their beck and call and even starting money is you know pretty pretty fucking good and the biggest little bit of hopium that you can smoke is that okay i'm 28 years old or i'm 26 year i'm 30 years old or whatever vince is fucking 78 if you can get a foothold in that company, now you're just rolling the dice that Mother Nature or Father Time or Old Man River or whoever comes to collect 80-year-old billionaires will do it while you've still got the fucking chance to prosper. There you go. Jim, a question from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. This one was sent by Josh Wilson. Would Jim have quit working for the WWE and left his position at OVW to work with the Jarretts during the early days of TNA if Shit Stain wasn't involved in TNA? <laughs> uh, no, I'm. I, the short answer is no. Uh, absolutely not. OVW was always my first priority because I was part owner of the company and is in my hometown, and that's the whole idea of what we were doing so i'd have to go anywhere anymore there's been a recurring theme for the last 20 years me not fucking going anywhere uh but if i can see because dutch mantel was involved and both jerry and jeff were involved um 
I can see that we probably may have worked together at some point, either, you know, well, no, I tell a lie because they, they were technically still, they were, they were considered competition by Vince and we had the developmental program, so we couldn't have really traded talent. You know, as far as some of my non-contract guys, I may have pitched trying to get them a spot there. Or, you know, there may have been phone calls back and forth. Hey, what do you think of this guy? I'm thinking of using that guy. Or have you seen, you know, just like that. But I don't think we could have done anything formal because of the uh, the WWE developmental deal. But at the same, I'm sure there would have been some conversation about something because we're only 180 miles apart. But no, I never... And as soon as I heard that Russo was involved, I never took him seriously, nor even watched any of the programs or, I, you know, I might read the shit, you know, the recaps of what they did, but I never actually saw any TNA until about three weeks before I went to work for him when, you know, Dutch had been calling me. I left WWE in July of 05 and Dutch called me that week and I said, I don't want to do anything right now. I'm, I've just gotten away from these fucking people driving me crazy. Um, and we stayed in touch back and forth. And finally, the next summer, they had something going on. And I'm trying to remember what it was. The Dutch said, well, we really need you to come in. And I need to make a ruling about the title. They needed an authority figure or a new one. And I needed to make a ruling about the title and play off of their summer pay-per-view. I said, all right. Was, and, that the, was that the clip that was just going around on social media where you're in the ring and like you fought, you break up Team Canada, you give the belt yes. back to you? Oh, that was awesome. Yes. That was yeah. great. Bro broke up Team Canada. I made several rulings. The crowd and went it, crazy for each ruling. Well, they were Except for Jeff. good rulings. Except for Jeff getting the belt back. Well, but then, but then <laughs> I kind of spit in his eye too. <laughs> but, you know, I've... I've been ruling rulings all morning. If you've read the rulings I've been ruling, you'll know they're really well-written rulings. But it, so anyway, that's that's how that came about. Is that I really I'd, I'd never seen the program because he it just it, instantly I heard he was involved and I tuned it out of my mind. Jim, you mentioned Uncle Dave before. The star ratings for WrestleMania weekend have come out. Have you seen any of these? I have not. Again, we're going through popular topics. I'm, I'm actually, I'm I'm seeing some stars now, but I think that's because of the head blow that I sustained when I was in my attic earlier trying to prep for the insulation. I'd be careful with that. But Jim, a lot of people, like, we're going through, uh, you th threw me off with the... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm seeing all these stars, you know, they're sparkling around me, but it looks like Dave's living room. Well, Jim, a lot of... Uh, Listeners have sent in questions in the last few hours about the WrestleMania star ratings from Dave because I guess they want to hear what you have to say about him, but a lot of people okay. sent this in. WrestleMania night one, Saturday, WrestleMania 39, Los Angeles. Austin Theory versus John Cena, two and a quarter stars. What? You think that's too high, too low? What do you think? No, well... See, I guess Dave, the poor thing, I guess as he got older, he's lost brain cells. And he thinks on a very, you know, basic level these days. And if, you know, there's the aggressive tumbling or the combative parkour or whatever that, you know, his favorites do, then he loads it up on stars. But no, John did not work like he did 20 years ago nor is he going to at his not only at his age but also because he's a multi-million air fucking movie and tv star and blah 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 so he wasn't going to be taking any brain busters off the top rope but he did exactly for austin theory what he should have done theory looked like a million dollars and was there for everything the finish was perfect and accomplished what it should have done and nobody tripped and fell down or obviously fucking got lost. So, you know, he's again, the original scale was 
One star is, yeah, glad that's over. Two stars is, that's about what we expected. Three stars is, that was really good. And four stars was, they tore the fucking house down. But now that he regularly gives seven fucking stars to obscure girls matches from Yokohama, it doesn't have any credibility. When you give something two stars, that's the equivalent of pissing in its face. So. On my scale, I still say scene in theory, didn't stink, good action, right finish, making a star, building business, all of the people liked it. They didn't like the finish, that was the idea though, but the people in the building enjoyed what they were seeing. If that can't be a three-star match on Uncle Dave's seven scar, seven scar, seven star scale of doom. Seven scars. <laughs> the seven scars of doom. <laughs> but no, if, if he can't even give Cena and Theory at WrestleMania three stars for, for doing all the right things, I don't know what the fuck he's thinking. The next match, the men's four-way showcase tag team match. <clears throat> three and three-quarter stars. What? Now, you didn't watch that match. To be I fair. didn't watch it, but uh, again, for all the superficial reasons that he watches wrestling, apparently, oh, they did a bunch of moves. It's a fucking four-way meaningless tag to get two, four, six, eight guys, a WrestleMania payoff and not piss off, you know, your tag teams because you had nothing else for them. And the fucking things are pointless and who gives a shit? But that can nearly be a four-star match like, wow, they tore the house down, as opposed to John Cena and Austin Theory. This is what I'm talking about. Dave's playing checkers, and we're playing chess. Well, I guess to compare the two, and again, I enjoyed the match, but the match wasn't a... It was as close to an AEW-style match as you'll see in WWE, where it's about getting big pops for big spots. But like you said... At the end of the day, it's a meaningless match with meaningless teams. The Cena match, although no flips or anything, the story and what it did, do you think that should weigh into the star rating? Yes, yes, as well as the drawing power of same. Uh, you can't tell me that nobody that ordered or bought or watched WrestleMania in whatever manner of distribution you can't tell me absolutely none of those people bought that or watched it specifically because John Cena was on a show. You can tell me that nobody specifically watched or bought for that four-way tag, and I would believe that. So that we're also weighing into that a little bit as well. Well, the next match was Logan Paul versus Seth Franklin Rollins. Four and a half stars. Okay, in all, I, I, and again, except for the most, you know, infrequent and just wildly levels above, you know, something that comes along, I, I don't know why we're going over four stars anyway, because five was meant to be the well, goddamn, you know, actual murder in front of our eyes couldn't have torn this fucking place apart any more than this. Uh, but I think that was a four-star match because of the athleticism involved as well as the heat and the story and the whole nine yards. It, we didn't particularly enjoy all the promos leading up to it because of Seth being whatever the fuck Seth is. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I can see that being a four-star match. In your eyes, you said five stars is, I forget the way you put it, like just total destruction, kicking ass. Well, it just uh, levels above whatever the fuck because there there is no five star movie, right? They don't do this. So the, therefore, you know, it was it was like just meant to go. Holy shit! That you don't gonna see anything like that more than once every year or so. Is five but stars? Now he's. <laughs> is it perfection? Do you see it as perfection? A five star? No, match? nothing's nothing's perfect. Even in the moment, perfect. even in its time, nothing's perfect. Even in the moment, and especially if you're watching on video, but even in the moment live, in a pro wrestling match, there is always going to be something that you see that either didn't land right or was oversold or missed or didn't look right or make sense or whatever that will 
show you that it's a work, but if they're very minimal or few, then the overall body of the thing, you know, you can get caught up in, but it can't. And the only, the only perfect pro wrestling match would be one that tore the house down with the audience that was watching it. But at the same time, you couldn't see any fucking cooperation or tell anything was a work. That would be the perfect pro wrestling match. And hopefully it makes a few bucks also while we're at well, it. Well, yeah, that, that's why I'm, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that the house that we're tearing down is, is full, but that, yeah, you know, you've seen those. And in the old days, there were the ones that got close, but you've seen those where the people are hopping up and down and it's a big match and you've lost yourself and they get almost all the way through, but there's always something. But that would be the yeah. perfect thing. Solo Sokoa. That's there's always something. Well, whatever. But people throwing the babies in the air, you couldn't see through a fucking thing in the whole match, and you know, goddamn, that that would be perfection. It's probably never happened. Well, Jim, the next match, another one I don't believe you watched: Damage Control You're versus right. Lita, Becky Lynch, and Trish Stratus. Two and three quarter stars. I can't comment because I didn't watch it and it, it doesn't sound like it's ridiculous either way. I would, I would <laughs> remember between two and three is between about what we expected it to be. And boy, that was really good. So there you go. Ray Mysterio versus Dominic Mysterio, four stars. I, I can probably see that also for the execution. Remember we said Dominic looked uh, that was the one that he looked, you know, better than just about anything else because that he's ever done, because obviously it's his father also, and they've got a, you know, a vested effort in working together as well as they possibly can. But I, I don't know that, um, I don't know that that's offbeat, uh, maybe between three and four, just because, well, even this was one of the main draws of the show. So I got, I don't have a problem with that. Fuck it. Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley. Okay, no, wait, wait a minute. Before you say that, this is where if Uncle Dave is going to be honest with people, he needs to start hauling out the six and seven. If he can give Twinkle Toes McFinger Bangs seven stars in the Tokyo Dome, he can give the potentially best women's match that's ever been held in the WWE at least five or six, can he? Four and three quarter stars. <laughs> okay, he can't. Um, and see, this is where you know. <sighs> then no women's match can ever get five stars in his inflated scale because if he's given six out to this Yahoo and you know seven out to Harpo, they can't even get five. That seems a little stingy of him. There's never, I don't know there's ever going to be another, uh, a better girls match in the WWE until they have their rematch. I thought it was the best match I've ever seen in North America, as I keep saying it, just because there are some phenomenal matches I used to love from Japan, but I haven't seen anything of this caliber from women in America. And, and this was a whole different style, obviously, than the 90s, yes. you know, Japanese women. But at the same time, it wasn't that different than the 80s, 90s American male style at a, you know, on, on except for the moonsault off the top rope. But you know what I'm saying? The working they did that is just above most of the girls' heads. So anyway, we say apparently Uncle Dave is misogynist, or is it misogynistic or misogynation? I wouldn't or, say. Or potentially menage a trois. Well, I don't know where you're going, but let's get back to these star ratings here. I don't even know how you call this a match. The Miz versus Pat McAfee, <laughs> one and a half stars. Um, well, I mean, it kind of was what it was. I'm not going to spend my time debating this. The main event of night one, the Usos versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Five stars. <sighs> Again, the only reason I'm I'm going <sighs> is because, yes, they tore the house down. It was a very good tag team match. People got to finish. They wanted it. Definitely drew money. I, is it something a level above 
things that you'll see uh you know more than once a year or so which was the original concept of a five star match as i just said earlier and maybe that's not it the reason i said five for charlotte and ripley is because you're not going to see a girls match that good you know for a while and haven't seen it for a while before so but yay let's give them four and a half on the corny scale though they've done a good job you see, for a lot of the intangibles you talked about earlier, I could understand, for me personally, I wouldn't have gone five stars, but I could understand doing that because the monster pop, it was the big moment, everyone was happy, the guys did a good job, a lot of super kicks, but everyone did good. But how do you not give Rhea and Charlotte at least an equal, I mean, that match tore the house yeah. down. Yeah. That match took the crowd out of the early part of the main event, they got five stars. I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I'm confused with you. Well, night two, here are the night two ratings, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and Dave Meltzer for WrestleMania 39. The opening match, Brock Lesnar versus Omos, uh, Omos, whatever his name is. <laughs> Did you see in their video game, they have a couple of different categories. One of them's lazy booking and one of them's almost famous. I saw that. Someone's I listening. I saw that. Someone's listening. Lesnar versus Omos, three stars. <sighs> okay, see. They had the tear down the house part because people like to see Brock throwing the the big guy around, but it did, didn't all tear the house down until that point. Um, that's the kind of weasel dooley. That's the kind of match in the old days, the big giant monster man match. It you can't tell me that it was a major draw in WrestleMania except for Brock's involvement, just his name being advertised. It could have been Brock versus you know, Cooter Benchley. Um, I can't see that being more than a two-star match because we're more relieved that it's over and it didn't suck. What do you think? I liked it. I liked that kind of big man match where it's short and they just kick the crap out of each other and before you get sick of it, it's over. <clears throat> and no one really got hurt. Like, anyone could have won that match. I'm okay with it there, and I agree with you. It didn't draw anyone, so it was just an added attraction. It was a big attraction match. The Giant versus the, whatever, the Sabretooth. I don't know what. The Beast. Me. The Beast. Did you see? <laughs> Someone tweeted out something. I forget who it was, and I wish I could give you credit. I'm sorry. It had a Brock Lesnar thing, you know, the Beast Incarnate. And then it had a picture of Brandy on the mic, and it said, You may be the Beast Incarnate, but I'm the bitch incarnate. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I had somebody tweet me the fucking uh, split screen, right? The beast incarnate. And on the other side was a freeze frame of me and Severn. It said the beast and cornet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that one. All right. Well, that was Lesnar versus almost a women's four way showcase tag team match. Oh, seriously. I don't believe you watched this one either. No. Two and a half stars. All right, but I'll, I'll accept that. So far, the Cena match. The Cena match, it, one of the three probably big draws is the lowest rated encounter. Well, no, McAfee versus The Miz has it. Oh, beat, wow. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, neither guy was even dressed, so. Gunther versus Drew McIntyre versus Sheamus. Five-star match. <sighs> okay, I will... The, the only, for today's environment, I'll go with it. The fact that it was a three-way that was so confusing and they did all the modern shit they do, I, I, that to me didn't tear the house down as a stellar example of pro wrestling, maybe modern wrestling, but the stiffness and the, the overall slobber knocker atmosphere, I'll let him have that. Asuka versus Bianca Belair. Three and three quarter stars. Okay, I'm not even going to argue this fucking point. At least it goddamn wasn't <laughs> as big as Charlotte and Rhea's. But I'm not going to get in the weeds on dissecting Bianca and Oscar. The Miz versus Snoop Dogg. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> I may get down in some weed to talk about Snoop Dogg. Um, 
Would you like to join me down in the weeds as we talk about Snoop Dogg? Absolutely. One star match. Oh, come on. Uh, and by the way, they've announced Shane has undergone surgery. Yes, Shane. <laughs> they sent him to Dr. James Andrews. Hey, Shane's in Birmingham. That used to be... Oh. I think guys would say to the locker room to each other, I'll send you down to Birmingham. Everybody knew what that meant. I mean, there's so many different ways. As, no, as a wrestling match, it didn't deserve. I think Uncle Dave about 30 years ago gave one of Giant Gonzalez's matches like negative four stars or whatever. As a wrestling match, this was what was created by Weasel Dooley to be a dud, D-U-D. And Dave doesn't use those anymore. I think he used to, but he doesn't anymore, does he? It hurts people's feelings. That's right. That, I think that's a reason it was given, wasn't it, at one time, when he stopped doing dud? I forgot about dud until you just brought it up. I forgot yeah. that existed. Yeah. yeah, because it was one through four stars and a complete stinker, a four-finger stinker. That means you need to stick all four fingers down your throat to make yourself fucking puke hard enough to get all the taste out. A four-finger stinker was a dud. We talked about the Snoop Dogg, Shane McMahon incident and commended Snoop Dogg for jumping into action now. Oh, thinking ahead. Yes, but as a pro wrestling match, the whole, and really you ought to rate two matches. You ought to rate Shane McMahon versus Miz, which which when you think about it, Shane Shane's drop down was beautiful and his leapfrog was gorgeous till the landing. You know what? We had so much fun talking about that the other day. There's two big things we left out. One... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody left <laughs> when Shane was in midair. <laughs> Michael Cole starts with, he still got it. And he, <laughs> lands, and he fucking tears his He still got it, and there it went. That was amazing. And, and again, he's had it. And Snoop Dogg saved the day. We didn't talk about his running of the ropes where he didn't lift either arm he, yeah, he would just, just turn around and like lean back well remember i kind of <laughs> glossed over it when i said it looked like shit till it got there and then it hurt but everything to the lead up to the people's elbow yes but see again there's a I, some fans pick up on it just because they've seen it visually but you would be surprised some people that watch wrestling like snoop dog obviously has for quite a percentage of his life and they still run at those ropes, and it's almost like they're running into a goddamn electrified fence or something. They're just, oh, shit, they just clinch up. And that's what he did. And then again, and then stopping. And when he brought that elbow down, though, you can, you can tell a shoot elbow drop when the point of the fucking elbow to the sternum is the very first thing that makes contact. Right then, you know you've been dropped an elbow on. Hey. In terms of the way he ran the ropes, I'm laughing about it because it looked so ridiculous. I'm used to seeing yeah. wrestlers run the ropes. If you have a celebrity, if you're the booker and you have a celebrity on your show, you're going to use them for whatever reason in the ring and they're going to run the ropes. Do you want them to run like that? Like they have no idea how to do it? As opposed <laughs> to like, train me so I could do it really well like you guys. And then all of a well, sudden they're running the ropes the way that, how would the layman get in there and run the ropes like that? You want something in between. Remember, the porridge needs to be neither too cold nor too hot. It looks, it, it not only calls attention to an aspect of phoniness when somebody runs the ropes like Snoop Dogg did because it was obviously phony and he didn't know what he was doing, but also if he'd have accidentally had any more momentum he could have hurt himself if you hit the ropes and you don't have an arm over the top, then you've seen guys, you know, go straight through backwards, snap the fucking neck, you know, whatever the cut, you get whiplash. I wouldn't, depending on the celebrity, if it was a celebrity from another professional sport, well, then you got something to work with. If it's goddamn, you know, a musician, you might try to not have them in a perfect world hit the ropes to begin with, but almost anybody can run and lean into the ropes to get some momentum for something and look like they're going to do something if you just explain to them how. So if Snoop had like three miles an hour going on, 
if somebody really takes off from about eight feet away and hits those ropes to get some momentum to do something, then that's not something that needs a lot of training except how not to fucking fall out of the ring or break your neck when you're doing it. So if I had a celebrity that was being set up to do something like that, I would teach them the basics of here's how not to fucking hurt yourself. And, the, you know, but then whatever it is, it is. My rating for that match, five stars. <laughs> I knew it. Five star match. I had a great time. I popped like crazy. A couple more matches. Hell in a Cell, Finn Balor versus Edge. Three and three quarter stars. Oh, God. We talked about the issues with that. And, you know, I can't deny them the, 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 the enjoyment of nearly getting four stars from Uncle Dave for all the physical abuse they went through, even if there was a lot of problems with presentation and execution of that match. And finally, the main event, Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes, four and a half stars. See, that that was a five-star match with a one-star finish. Should that take overall points away in your eyes? Yeah, well, and see, that's the thing. When you, if you, if you have ninety-eight percent of the best sex you ever had, followed by either a goddamn tree falling through the roof right before you come, or fucking a home invasion at gunpoint at the end of it, do you really want to remember that for the rest of your life? From that day forward, they called me Treetop. <laughs> I agree with you. I thought it was an excellent match. I think if Cody had gotten the victory and it had been a celebration and clearly the fans were ready to go crazy, it would have been a perfect moment, a perfect match. But those are the WrestleMania star ratings. One last thing before we get out of here today, Jim, with this bonus drive through Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. People are still assuming Cody's eventually going to get the title. Again, who chased the belt more than Dusty? Although Dusty never lost on a big stage like Cody just did with WrestleMania after that kind of build. SummerSlam is in Philadelphia. SmackDown coming up soon at the Garden. Some people pointed to the idea that maybe the Garden was where the belt was stolen from Dusty in the story. Oh. Cody gets the belt from Roman or gets a match with Roman at the Garden. Or Philadelphia playing on Rocky and... He goes into Rocky's hometown to win the belt the way Rocky did in Rocky 2. Oh, boy. No, wait, that's the other guy. That's the guy over in the other company that books off the Rocky movies. We're not talking about him right now. That was Rocky 3. Um, no, first of all, they're absolutely crazy. Crazy as a rainbow trout in a car wash crazy. Pee picking nuts if they after all this time and all that they've gone through, switch the belt on free SmackDown television just because they're in Madison Square Garden. I think people are looking too deep and potentially, you know, who was in the uh, the theater box with John Wilkes Booth? They're trying to find conspiracies where there are none. Um, I can believe SummerSlam, but not for a Rocky tie-in, because that is the next really major pay-per-view. And did you see what Lex Luger tweeted the other day? Somebody tweeted no. somebody tweeted, name a time that pro wrestling made you really mad. And Luger tweeted SummerSlam 93. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he knows. He knows. Uh, but Cody's already been SummerSlammed. So the question is now, does, you know, is that the, the, the rematch, the, you know, the switch, is there going to be a switch? We don't know, but I would think just because it's a next major pay-per-view, not because it's in, you know, Philly, home of Rocky, etc. but I can't imagine that they would do it not on a major live event with a worldwide audience tuning in and, and a lot of build. That would be my assumption. For the record, Friday SmackDown is coming to Madison Square Garden Friday, July 7th. Well, maybe he can do it on a deck of the Intrepid. <laughs> you know what? Watch Vince suggest that. 
<laughs> Before we wrap things up, any new thoughts about Vince's mustache? A lot of people have thought Ernie Kovacs may be someone to look I mean, at. Or... Yes, yes, actually, I believe uh, uh, someone, uh, a brilliant individual, uh, suddenly had the epiphany. It's Ernie Kovacs, and I'm I'm liking a lot of the comparisons of late stage Walt Disney, but as well. We have, you know, the, uh, oh my God, what's his name? Frank something, the character actor that, you know, a guy would, you'd walk into a department store on a TV show in the 60s and, oh, clerk, and he'd go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about Red so Butler? Right, well, you know, but no, because here's the thing. Clark Gable had the black <laughs> mustache and the black hair, but he was 45 years younger and gone with the <laughs> That's true. So you can't That's really true. blame that on Clark. But again, the idea not to just go with a mustache. If Vince showed up with a mustache, like, oh, wow, this, this is a bold move. But it's the little stylish mustache. It's everything. It's everything. He looks like he's been finger painted by Earl Scheib. It's not only the obnoxiously, fakely colored mustache in a weird, pencil-thin, silent movie villain, you know, uh, preparation there, but also the... The eyebrows that look, suddenly he went from a guy with normal eyebrows that were mostly gray to the fucking son of Wild Bull Curry <laughs> and and the hair, which has been now, you know, it's true because those and they're and they're independent of each other. They move around on their own. I don't know if they're do they make Lee press on eyebrows? <laughs> I don't know if he can feel his it, forehead. And so he doesn't know what those eyebrows are doing. They're going into business for them. So I bet if they're caterpillars, they're going to start doing circles. On his head, he won't be able to feel it. But also the fact that he's been on television as recently as last summer when he came out and bid adieu uh, with normal human-colored hair. And now it, you know, again... But again, the timing. He was accused of being a pervert, went away, and this is how he reappears. He comes back to look like a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> and no one said anything no one come on no one said either vince or hey dad what the fuck no I, one has said know, anything we heard about this mustache like a month ago that means he has kept it at that length for at least six weeks to eight weeks the only ones that that i can think that could say anything that would say anything because you know Bruce ain't going to say that he's going to, he's going to maybe rib him a yeah. little bit, but at the same time, putting him over about how snazzy he looks. Bruce will grow a mustache. And that's what he'll do. <laughs> um, Watch. <laughs> but you know, Kevin Dunn's going to love it. Oh, Vince, you look 30 years younger. I'm sorry. Vince, you See, he should have a younger. mustache. It would hide the teeth. And oh, fuck no. Then it would just look like a picket fence growing out of somebody's fucking twat hair. But what? But I, the only two people that I think <laughs> that could actually say something and would say something would be Linda and Stephanie. And Linda's far away, free to pursue a life of religious freedom these days. And maybe Stephanie just ain't going to get involved. Well, this has been the bonus drive through. Of course, more action like this on the Jim Cornette experience and Jim you've Cornette's drive-thru. You've never, you've never thought of, envisioned of something looking like a picket fence coming out of twat hair? I've never had that vision, and I'd never put those words all together in that kind of fashion. So when you that's said it... I'm a, that's because I'm a visionary. A cunning linguist, as it were. But as I was saying, this has been the bonus drive through We hope you've enjoyed it. Of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel and... You'll hear us on the drive through Any Experience, wherever you find your favorite podcast. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!